Welcome to the Impact Multiplier CEO Podcast. If you're a chief executive, or if you think like one, and you want to create exponentially greater impact, then this show is for you. My name is Richard Metcalf, founder of X Quadrant. I coach some of the most successful and impressive CEOs and executive teams on the planet and help them achieve extraordinary results. And no matter how successful you've been in the past, there's always a whole new level of impact available to you. So if you're ready to play a bigger game than ever before, I invite you to join us and become an Impact Multiplier CEO. Today I speak with Kelly Schmidt. She's the CEO of Benevity, a certified B Corporation and the global leader in corporate purpose software. We're continuing the season on the CEO learning curve, where we look at what is the story of really interesting CEOs after they've been in the job for a year or two. And with Kelly, it's fascinating. She never wanted to be chief executive. And we find out what the circumstances were that made her change her mind. It's pretty extraordinary. Secondly, she explains what she felt she had to be good at as CEO. And in fact, the reality was different. So we find out, in fact, what you don't need to be amazing at to nail the role. In fact, what you do need to be good at and why two of her predecessors as CEOs failed within just weeks of being appointed. So this is a really interesting area. What was it that two amazing CEOs with great CVs didn't do that led them to leave the company within weeks? And then finally, what is the relevance of purpose in modern corporate culture? We talk about purpose a lot, but how important is it really? And if you want to do good, how do we make that fun and easy for our employees? Kelly's a really vibrant and charismatic person. Uh, this is a great conversation. So do enjoy this interview with Kelly Schmidt. Hi, Kelly, and welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, Kelly, I'm looking forward to this. Benevity seems a really interesting uh, business. It's there. It's a company with a purpose. It's a B Corp. Um, and I'm looking forward to finding out about it. Um, but I'm also really curious as to find out, you know, your own role. You became CEO, um, I think, just over a year ago. And uh, before that, you had a finance career. And you, know, you told me just before we, we, we started recording that you never even wanted to be CEO. So this is going to be a fun one. Um, first of all, do you want to give us a, just a quick description of what is Benevity, right? And also what attracted you to, to join in the first place? Yeah, for sure. So Benevity, uh, we are the global market leader in what we call corporate purpose software. So our platform is used by you know, more than 800 companies around the world, including companies like Apple and, and Google and Amazon and Nike, uh, to power their community investment and their employee uh, giving and volunteering programs. And so the whole premise behind Benevity was to democratize uh, giving back. So take it from something that was a once a year arm twisting exercise where your mm. company, you know, pressured you to give to the United Way or whatever they thought was important right. to, and take that and change it into an experience where uh, individuals could uh, support the causes and the issues they cared about. And they could do anything from, you know, give money in an amount, however big or small, they could give their time, they could do things like reduce their water usage or their carbon footprint or just do you know, simple acts of kindness, like, like helping out um, a neighbor. Um, and so you know, the neat thing is you know, our, our own uh, data of users within our platform shows that companies who engage their people in these activities around giving and volunteering, they actually experience 57% less employee turnover. So there's a really strong desire um, of young people today to connect their passions for making a social impact with their work lives rather than it being something that's done sort of separately uh, in your spare time. Yeah, I, it's, it's interesting. It's a real trend, right? I mean, it's definitely um, there. I was talking with some leaders just the other day and, you know, they're all like, thinking, well, how do we, you know, we've almost got to like make sure we don't over rotate. I mean, because it's like there's so much 
there is so much energy around purpose and you know this the leader I was saying you know I love it all and I'm there were, we were there were B Corp as well you know everything else but it's like we've also got to keep the commercial focus because otherwise there's so much energy that gets put around it which is a really interesting view so but in a sense it's great that that's a problem that you're having to hold people back in to some degree um so yeah so it's obviously a highly motivating, I'm sure it's, you know, it's a motivating mission that you're on, right? Helping companies deploy this and, and actually build out that, that purpose side. Um, so tell me about, about how did you, you know, how did you end up joining? What's the story there? Yeah, so I actually had a, a career in finance. And so originally joined Benevity about three and a half years ago as the CFO. Uh, you know, kind, kind of a funny story because um, the first reach out I got from Benevity was less than a week after we had our second child. So I was definitely not, you know, out in the market looking for you want, yeah. a, new, a new role. <laughs> but, you know, I guess, um, you know, some say my career claim to fame is I've been the CFO of, of three Calgary tech unicorns and there are very few tech unicorns uh, mm. here. Um, so smart technology, Solium and now, and now Benevity. Um, but, but I think my true claim to fame is, is actually the other piece. It's, it's that, you know, I had both of our children as a CFO and actually took eight months off, you know, with each of them and they're, they're six and three now. So I'm very passionate about, um, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, and belonging. And at Benevity, we are 54% female and, and 60% at the exec level, which is extremely rare for, for a tech company. And so a lot of what uh, attracted me to Benevity in the first place, of course, the mission is very compelling. And that's what attracts many um, people to mm -hmm. uh, the company, but it's also the culture and the values fit there. Like, you know, the, the fact that you could find a company that's doing uh, definitely walking the talk on, on things like diversity, it was really important to me. Yeah, that, it's, that's really exciting. So, okay. So you come in, you know, you juggle this, this, um, you, know, you juggle your, ch your children and then they're older, the CFO. And uh, I'm always interested, you know, what. What was it that ended up making you the CEO, right? Because that's always a jump, right? Not everybody makes a jump from CFO to CEO. So what was your story there? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, to be honest, as you as you mentioned earlier, it, it's not a role I was striving toward or, or actually even wanted. I would say, in fact, <laughs> the first couple of times it was suggested, I outright resist and said, like, look elsewhere. That is not me. And so, you know, for me, I... Actually, I'm going to slow really, you down. I'm going to slow you down there, Kelly. Let's slow you down a yeah. second because I'm fascinated. Why didn't you think it was you? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was, I was getting to that. So I was really happy. I was kind of a combination of a CFO and a chief operating officer. So I had okay. quite a broad role. I loved being the number two and, and sort of being that internally facing person who just executed and made stuff happen. And right. so the, the reasons I didn't see myself as the CEO was mainly because uh, I didn't want to be in the spotlight. So I m didn't want to be the person on stage speaking at the conferences. I also thought to be a CEO, I had to be the company's best salesperson, or I had to be a great product visionary. And, you know, I looked at what our founder did and he was amazing at all of those things. And I just didn't see myself as those things. And so how it kind of ended up happening is you know, as a company, we tried twice um, to hire externally to find a CEO successor for our founder. And, you know, both times we hired, um, you know, US-based executives with impressive resumes. And, and, and both times we experienced what I, what I call organ rejection, where the folks we hired were great people, but they weren't a fit with our culture or values. And so after sort of living through that experience and, and witnessing it firsthand, I really just came to realize that the job is all about people. So what's the role that I have as the CEO? It's continue to build a great team and, and foster a culture that people want to be part of. And, and once I decided that I could do that, and also I could just build a great exec team around me to handle some of the things that were my weaknesses, it was a lot less scary to, to make that leap. Yeah, thank you for sharing, because I think it's helpful because other other people put in the same boat like do i do i have what it takes can i be a ceo and uh, i think your, your point is is right it's i like to talk with my clients who are often ceos or, or aspiring ceos and it's all around like what's actually your zone of responsibility and what's not and so i love to say to people like don't make you know don't make functional decisions because you've got an executive team with 
those functional responsibilities. So as soon as you start to exercise your CEO power in that way, you're just stepping on people's toes and you're demotivating people, right? Um, and don't even make cross-functional decisions because they should be just, you shouldn't be playing referee, right? They should be figuring it out between them. And so they're like, well, what's left if I can't make functional decisions or cross-functional decisions, what's left? And um, my point is, well, you know, building the leadership culture of the company, right? Championing the vision, articulating it, being, you know, being the embodiment of it. Um, making sure that you know managing your your own team because people need managing even if they're super experienced you know um creating a harmonious leadership team who can f work effectively together you know all these things um one of my clients was making an acquisition and, and it was like well apply the same principle your job is not to do the due diligence that's your cfo's responsibility it's to understand the the leadership culture that you're acquiring and is that going to actually be a fit and, and everything else so uh really fascinating that yeah you've come to that conclusion that actually you didn't have to be the chief product officer or the chief sales officer you had to manage yeah, the people dimension had, yeah and, and in the end we actually had a you know a pretty robust succession plan in place for our founder so our founder had been the ceo for the, since the company's inception so for 13 years and and so by the time i took the reins just over a year ago I was already responsible for pretty much everything in the business except product and tech. So my, my scope grew. And then when I shifted into this role, you know, our VP of finance became the CFO, our VP of marketing became the chief impact officer out doing thought leadership. And, and our founder also continued to be involved in the business part-time. So it's actually made the whole transition uh, pretty seamless. Yeah, that's fascinating. So one of the questions I was going to ask you, but I think we've already got onto it really, is what were the biggest surprises that you discovered about being CEO? And in a sense, one surprise might have been that you didn't have to be the chief product officer or, or whatever. But what else have you, you know, what else kind of took you a bit by surprise as you entered into this, into this role? Yeah, I don't know how much this first one is a surprise, but because uh, I, I definitely knew the job would be really hard. And for sure, it is the hardest job I've ever had. And I, I get why CEO tenures are often pretty short, you know, four or five years on average, because, you know, being responsible for 900 people, five private equity firms that we have as investors, and then and then running a business that has to meet the bar and the expectations of some of the biggest companies in the world, like it's it's an incredible challenge, but it's not, it's not an easy challenge. And so, um, you know, I have to be really careful about ensuring, you know, my physical and mental health is, is taken care of, or it can, it can feel quite crushing. You know, maybe some of the surprises in the first year were, you know, just when you think about a role, that's really all about people, like how much time I would spend debating things like, what our COVID vaccination policy should be and whether it was safe to reopen offices when you've got people on all sides of these debates and, and, and tricky issues, you know, how much time would be spent worrying about the mental health of our team and what we could do to support them as, you know, we're in now two years into a pandemic. Um, and maybe the biggest surprise of all is just like that I would actually enjoy being client facing and speaking at conferences because I didn't view myself as that externally facing ambassador but but actually I'm I'm quite enjoying it well isn't it fascinating um that sometimes we end up pigeonholing we end up pigeonholing ourselves uh and we you know because of what we've done in the past or the way we've operated in the past and yet there's always a new thing to come out of us is what I love seeing with my clients you know it's like what's the next What's the next version of you coming through, right? What's the next thing you want to bring out? And it's often a new facet. Um, so it sounds like, yeah, you're on this crazy podcast. So you must mustn't be too averse to uh to, to doing these things these days. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, so what would your, you know, having had this couple of years of experience, you know, what would your top tip be for new CEOs as they enter the role? You know, what would you, how what, what advice would you give them? Yeah, hard to narrow down to one. So, you know, one one would be the, what I mentioned earlier. It's making sure you take care of your own mental and physical health above all else. So, you know, my routine is I work out every morning. I drink what you might call like an adrenal cocktail that boosts my energy and my immune system. And I also meet regularly with a mindfulness and meditation coach, even though meditation is not really my thing. The mindfulness piece really helps because, you know, ultimately like your company, your team will go through uh, tough times. And, and so even when you feel like curling up in a ball and, and hiding under a pillow, you, you're the one that has to show up and inspire them and, and give them 
hope and, and a path forward. Um, you know, I also think it, it's great to be authentic and show vulnerability with your team. You know, for example, I cried during a company town hall last week over the situation in Ukraine because our team is you know, working directly with clients and users to support the humanitarian efforts. The work's been really challenging, sort of round the clock, very emotional. And when people see you're right in it with them, it just goes a long way to, um, you know, making them feel they can share their emotions, like they're really tied to the culture and, and feel yeah. a little bit less alone. Um, may, well, let me, let, let, let me, let me pick up on that yeah. point, because it's, it's a hard one for me. Um, my, I've said it before, my sister's severely mentally handicapped. And I always felt I had to be, I didn't realize at the time it was normal, it was life, right? But I always I actually realized I always felt I had to be basically have it all together because my parents had enough to deal with, you know? And one thing I've had to learn on, on my own journey, I think, is to actually not just pretend I'm the smartest person in the room with it all together, you know, all the time and, and whatever and have it all together and actually... Um, actually say things one of the things I do often I did it with my CEO group just the other day I started off by saying what I don't want you to know about me is dot 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 and at that point you can't prepare it if you prepare it it's fake and people see through it you actually have to stop and go what's the thing I actually don't want to tell these people and what it does is it just breaks you through to another level because when you actually share something that people can see it emotionally on your face this is a painful you know this is hard for you to say then suddenly there's this energy that wasn't there before. I love that. I'm going to use that going forward. Yeah. You, <laughs> you, gotta, you mentioned, yeah. Uh, Richard, not, you know, be, having to be the smartest person in the room. I, I think I'm rarely the smartest person in the room. Yeah. Most often one of the hardest working, rarely the smartest. And actually, you know, you've reminded me another tip I would give to new CEOs in that same vein is like, get your dream team in place. Mm as soon as possible. Like do not waste a minute starting the process because yeah. it can take time to find the right people. So of course you, you want to hire strong people to cover your own gaps and your own areas of weakness. But also if you know in your gut that some of the current exec team do, don't have what it's going to take to get the company to the next level, you know, mm. you're best to move them on and, and mm. go find who you do need. And so I actually spent most of my first year adding key people to the exec team plus the leadership team one level down, it, it felt like for a while, all I did was interview and, and sell the Benevity story yeah. uh, to potential hires. And it is paying off, you know, in a big way now, because my role is now a lot easier. I'm, yeah. I'm not spending time, as you alluded to, jumping in to do other jobs. And I can focus on what I need to do as a CEO. You know, one interesting story on that front is it, it took me 11 months from the first time I met our chief people officer to when she joined us. <laughs> last summer. And, you know, she came to us from Shopify. She had all the experience we needed to scale our team globally. And, and, you know, she's given me and our team a massive lift and was worth waiting yeah. for and convincing, but could have I hired someone in a shorter time? I totally could have, but mm -hmm. I would have been settling. And, and it's really important to sort of like get those great people in and, and build that dream team so that you and the company can be successful. It's Richard here with a quick interlude. As part of my coaching and advisory work, I often work with leaders who have recently taken on the CEO role. It's a big leap from the comfort zone of functional leadership or business unit management. And it opens up a whole new set of stakeholders, pressures, decisions, and responsibilities. I found that there are three key things that will make a huge difference in those first quarters. Number one, balancing the operational and the strategic what I call CEO focus. Number two, establishing credibility, what I call CEO presence. And number three, managing stakeholders, those CEO conversations. I've written a short email series that goes into more detail on the transition to CEO and how you can practically sharpen your CEO focus, solidify your CEO presence and master your CEO conversations. It's insightful, and it's entirely free of charge and you can register for it by going to xquadrant.com forward slash go forward slash curve. Now, back to the conversation. Yeah, yeah, it's laying foundations, right, for everything else. And sometimes foundations take a while to put in, but uh, 
it's investment, right? You get it, you make the investment, it's painful at the start, and then you get the return going forward. So yeah, it's, it's a great point. So um, let's um, let's shift gears a little bit. I'm gonna move into a little quick fire questions um, uh, section. Um, what's your favorite quote that governs how you lead or how you, how you show up in the world? Uh, the one that I was reminded of recently that just makes me smile is, is Steve Jobs. It's, if you want to make everybody happy, don't be a leader, go sell ice cream. And <laughs> I, I just love it because, you know, leadership is hard if you do it well. And, mm. and being a CEO, I think is, is the most difficult leadership role of all. Yeah, it's, 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 um, it's, it's a good one. People, so many people we're, we're driven, you know, it's easy to be driven by people pleasing, you know, and I always try to remind people whenever you're saying yes to somebody, you're saying no to somebody else. It's just that they're not in the room at the time normally. Like you're saying exactly. no to your kids, you're saying no to your, to your other customer, you're saying no to whatever, right? But um, it's very hard to hear that voice at the, in the moment. <laughs> What's a favorite app on your phone or something that, you know, that you, you turn to? You know, it's not, you, perhaps not your standard set of apps, but what's something which, which uh, well, you rely on? Probably- most highly used would, would be my two workout apps, so Beachbody On Demand and Peloton. Uh, but I'm also currently addicted to Wordle, along with, you know, half of the planet. So <laughs> not an app. But. <laughs> okay, yeah, there we go. So when, when, you're not, when you're not busy being a CEO, you get to uh, push, your brain, push your brain a bit more. That's good. Um, what about a book that uh, has really influenced you over the years? Yeah, I, I really like a, a, sort of all the leadership reading I've done, I, I like Brene Brown, Dare to Lead. And it's it's about the benefits of leading with vulnerability, which I was mm. speaking to earlier. So that's definitely one. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's a good one. That's a, it's a really good one. What advice would you give your 20 year old self if you were to go back in time? Oh, you know what? I would, I would probably tell her to, you know, get out of your comfort zone and top, stop telling yourself what you can't do. You know, I, I ultimately became the CEO because other people saw in me what I didn't see in myself. But really, you know, you can do anything, but you do have to get side, out, outside of that comfortable box um, and, and really push yourself to get there. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, it makes me think of, I, I often tell people this is like, think of a, imposter syndrome as a feature and not a bug. It's showing you that you, you're playing big, you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone and you're, you know, it's when your competence exceeds your confidence. Um, but often we shut ourselves down, right? People, you know, people will we'll say that it's not for us uh, or the CEO role is not for us or, or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, self-limiting beliefs, right? It, it happens happens easily. Um, another question I've got is, is who inspires you? You know, many, many of our best guests on the show come from referrals, right? And so I'm always curious to say, you know, who's somebody who you've encountered in your career who, you know, a CEO who's, who's inspired you and has perhaps given you a bit of a role model for what, what leadership might be like. Yeah. So, you know, my, my biggest inspiration and, and best mentor has definitely been, you know, Brian DeLottenville, who was the founder of Benevity. So, so hands down and just the way that uh, he was so thoughtful about building an inclusive, diverse culture with a real focus on values and, you know, kind of our top one being humility, meaning, you know, you're really self-aware, you know, there's always better, you're always open to learning and improvement like that. Um, you know, that has really shaped me, you know, one, one CEO that I've run into recently is, is a smaller company. Her name is, um, Bobby Reset. She is the CEO of a company called virtual gurus. And she is just really inspired me. She is a, a female lesbian indigenous CEO who's building a company, uh, building a great business, but with a strong social mission, uh, in, including doing things like employing people like single mothers and people of color who often mm. overlooked for roles. Yeah. And so she's got kind of an amazing personal story. Um, and, and also her business is growing like crazy. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. I, I love those kind of stories. It's, so, it's always a bit hard for me as some, you know, white male to, uh, yeah, I feel always a bit inferior when it comes to that, but I think it's um, it is it is uh, it's great. Actually, I've got a funny story about being a oh, I'm male. It's like living in France. I occasionally, 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 just very occasionally, um, and I find it hilarious when it happens. Occasionally, I look around the room and go, you know what? I am the di- I am the diversity candidate in this room. It's just I'm like I'm the only person that's not whatever French or, or you know 
whatever it is <laughs> it's just funny um but it's, yeah there's bad rooms to be in probably if yeah. i'm the diversity about manager. a year ago our our chief technology officer um who's also a white male pointed out to me he's like kelly if we want to diversify the exec team at Bedevity, we actually have to go hire more white males just <laughs> <laughs> So Reach it, brother. Go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, no matter how much we've achieved, there's always a next level to go to, right? That's why I call the podcast the impact multiplier, because there's always, we can always multiply our impact and, and find a new way forward. So where does Benevity go from here as a business? What's going to be your stretch as, as a business? Yeah, we actually went through a really fun exercise recently where we we drafted a, a 10 year vision for the company and I've never done that anywhere. And, and so we, we thought about how the world would be different if we are successful in, in sort of our goodness mission. And so if you think about where we are today, people use Benevity to do good and to give back as part of their work lives because their companies purchase our platform and they, the company matches their donations or they support volunteering or whatever the thing is. But the reality is, you know, people do good in many aspects of their lives, you know, whether that's their kids' schools, their sports teams, their churches, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I I get excited about a future, um, you know, where people think of Benevity and sort of pull out the app on their phone when they think of doing good in any aspect of their life. So, you know, Benevity is a verb, it's a household name. And and honestly, we live in a world where doing good is like brushing your teeth. Like, did you brush your teeth today? Yeah. Did you actually do something good today? Mm -hmm. Yes, because if everyone who who could did just one small act of goodness or kindness daily, you know, it adds up to massive social impact and it would make the world a much better place. And even in our sort of microcosm of it, you know, the average donation to use giving money as an example on our platform is like 50 bucks U.S., but yet we moved $2.3 billion last year to causes around the world. And so that's a lot of small um, acts that that add up. So when you think about that on scale, that's what gets me excited. Yeah, and it's interesting as well, isn't it? Because sometimes it's just imagination is often our biggest failure to to act. Like we just, it's not in front of us. We don't see it. It's the same in business. You know, if it's not in front of us, we often don't see it. We focus on the here and now, what's going on in front of us. Um, and I think doing good is a bit the same. You know, it's like. If you're, when it's easy, when it's something relatively convenient and easy, we're much more likely to do it than if we've got to like come up with the idea from scratch, implement it all, you know, yeah. all in a, all in the all in the hour or two that we've got free, or the five minutes that we've got free, or whatever it is. Um, so I think it's you're definitely feeling um, feeling um, a need, right? That can potentially change behaviors on a wide scale. So. Um, uh-huh. Not, and when we I sort think. of dial back that that ten year vision into kind of like a three year time horizon, that that's really our goal is what you just described is just make it easy and frictionless for people to do good. Like mm. that is the, the ultimate goal, right? So yeah, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, so yeah, I was stopping because it reminded me of a, a remind, reminded me of um, a a phrase. I won't edit it. It came from a, a religious context actually. It was somebody who said anybody who thinks that a lack of prayer is down to a lack of time had obviously not looked at social media or something to that effect. You know, the word is like, you know, we, we, it's not about prayer, it could be about all sorts of things, you know, but it's like, often we go, oh, we don't have time. And then of course, suddenly we look at where we do spend our time and we spend so much time on our phones, whatever. It's like, yeah, well, of course we would have had time to do, to do exercise or to do, you know, meditation, as you said, or prayer or any of these other things, you know, or doing good, right? And it's often... Um, because well social media or whatever it is is so easy and frictionless and people it's it becomes instinctive and if you can apply that to more useful um, activities that's fantastic so let's turn it to you um kelly i love this i love this question which is what do you what's your stretch as you go forward right what are you personally going to need to do differently reinvent yourself a bit more to multiply your impact, right? And, and to lead at a new level as, as Benevity moves forward. Yeah, it's a, it's a tough one to answer. I, I, I feel like- Yeah, I, I, and that's, why, that's why I like it. I put it at the end yeah, where people Leave it at up. the end. <laughs> uh, so, you know, just, there's always more to learn. I, I, I actually feel like I've barely scratched the surface on what it means to be a great CEO. So, you know, I, I do spend a, a, a decent amount of time actually just learning from others and, you know, parts of different CEO groups and, and just, just try to learn it, learn from others who, who have gone um, before me. But if I think about just like multiplying my own impact, 
it, it kind of ties back to something we talked about earlier, which is I, I just, I have to be very judicious about how I allocate my time mm. uh, to ensure it's, it's the things that, you know, make the most impact to Benevity's business, but also, you know, to my children, my family and, and, and kind of ultimately to the world, like time is just that one, you know, sort of resource that isn't infinite and you can't make more of. And I, I just try, I try sort of each day and each week to really think about like, what am I investing my hours in? And is this the biggest thing that will move Benevity forward? And if you sort of always keep that lens, I, I hope that over time that, that helps to multiply my impact. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, time is always, you know, it's always the thing, right? I think if I, almost every CEO has said at some point, you know, it's like I do need to ever level up where I spend my time. It's just, it's the only one. Hey, well, it's been um, fascinating talking to you. You can see by the light in my room that it's getting late here and I should have put the light on. So excuse me for my slightly um, luminous uh, figure here for those of you watching video. Um, but Kelly, it's been it's been fantastic to talk to you. I, you know, I love the mission that Benevity's on. I think it sounds like you're really onto something here. And, and there's a huge amount of, I guess of of um, vestige ahead, right? Um, opportunities to seize, and, and so many more places that this this can this can um, be deployed. So thanks for coming on and sharing this, you know, these really fun stories, right? About um, the way you came on board, not wanting to be a CEO, and actually realizing that the job was a bit different, and actually was for you. And actually, you know, you've really um, warmed up to that. So it's been a fantastic conversation and and really inspiring so thank you and i wish you all the best in um in your 10-year plan to get us all brushing our teeth uh, doing good on a daily basis it's fantastic amazing thanks richard okay thanks kelly take care goodbye i hope you enjoyed this conversation now let's talk about you when you're in top leadership when you're in the biggest role of your career who supports you at a deep level as you lead others who helps you multiply your impact and get to the next level. If you're ready to learn more about our content, our coaching, and our community, then visit us at xquadrant.com.